Good morning and welcome to the Cathedral Church of All Saints here in Halifax, Nova Scotia. We gather today to share in Eucharist at this 11 o'clock service. A reminder that we do have Sunday services at 9.30, this 11 o'clock service, and this Sunday we return to our Sundays at four series, services and music, this week Evensong, featuring the voices of Capella Regalis Men and Boys Choir. There's also a published schedule now for the uh, Sundays at Four series, copies of that available at the entrance areas here at the cathedral, or if you go to our new cathedral website, look under events, click on that and you will see a calendar that lists all the events and activities here at our cathedral. Wednesday mornings at 7.30 a.m., a Eucharist here in the cathedral, Noon on Wednesdays, Christian meditation in the Great Hall, and Fridays, a service of Holy Communion from the Book of Common Prayer at noon. Online, we continue to offer, again, this service, YouTube and Facebook, and Monday through Saturday morning prayer services posted at 6.30 a.m., available anytime through the day, as well as a Thursday evening meditation group that meets via Zoom. And beginning Monday, October 24th, a return of the teaching series, Pray As You Can, Not As You Can't. Saint Seraphim of Seraph, an 18th century monk and mystic, will be the guide as we explore some of the many ways to pray, each one as unique as the other. The series theme is When You Pray, Be Like, and then uses the metaphors of mountains, flowers, ocean, breath, and birds. St. Seraphim offers glimpses of the characteristics we can cultivate to aid our conversations with the divine. For information about that series or the meditation group, send an email to prayasyoucan3, that's the number three, at gmail.com. Also coming up next, I think that's next weekend already, is it? The 21st? Uh, the, we have been talking about this for some time and tickets are available at the door today. Standard Time Jazz Ensemble and an evening of jazz music. And for those who wonder just what that entails, I have this note to share with you. If you're one of those people who shies away from anything attached to the word jazz, thinking immediately that jazz is loud, avant-garde, instrumental music, you might be interested to learn that there are more than 12 different forms of jazz music. You're not doing all 12, are you, though? No. Standard Time Jazz Ensemble's mission is to give new life to all those great old songs from the 20s to the 40s and beyond. Just to put your minds at rest, there is a more mellow form of jazz, a mixture of blues and popular music, sometimes known as cool or soft jazz. So, for an entertaining evening, join us on the 21st for a jazz evening about love. Speaking of love, we send out congratulations today <clears throat> to Mary Barker and Ron Gilkey, celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary this weekend. And this weekend was also supposed to be our synod gathering. That had been postponed from May, which had been canceled because of COVID and canceled once again as a result of many parts of our diocese and province being without power. So on Friday evening, the bishop held a prayer vigil here. That service was recorded and is now available online through our website. Also a reminder that adopt a meal or the outreach committee will be preparing an adopt a meal on the 29th at 1 p.m. If you'd like to help out with that, just get in touch with, with uh, Deacon Ray Carter. Just needs to manage the numbers of those who would like to help in the kitchen. And those are our major announcements for today. Again, check out our new website where you'll find lots of up-to-date information. For those, again, joining us online, you will find today's bulletin and all of the information you need for today's service. As we begin, we do so with a territorial acknowledgement. Although we have come together in person and in digital space, we each stand on ground that is the ancestral territory of peoples who were here long before the European settlers crossed the ocean. We gather here in and from the Cathedral Church of All Saints Halifax, Nova Scotia, 
located on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And we join now in our opening hymn, 527, How Firm a Foundation. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
our colic prayer for today. Let us pray. God of the dispossessed, you teach us to hunger for justice, even when the weak are shut out and the powerful turn over in their beds. In the heat of our anger and the bitterness of our complaints, give us courage to protest, the persistence to pray, and the heart to love. Through Jesus Christ, the true judge. Amen. We invite you to be seated for the scripture reading. A reading from 2 Timothy. But as for you, continuing, uh, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you to proclaim the message, be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable, convince, rebuke, encourage, with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. The word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had any respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The Gospel of Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. You may be familiar with the word palindrome. A palindrome is a word, although it can also be a number, a phrase or any sequence of characters which reads the same front and back. Like the name Bob or Hannah or words like level and kayak. Reverse the letters and it spells the same word and has the same meaning. An entire sentence can be written as a palindrome such as step on no pets. Think about that one. Joseph Hayden's Symphony Number no. 47 in G, written way back in 1722, is nicknamed the Palindrome Symphony. In the third movement, it contains a minuet, which halfway through reverses the notes to complete it. The word palindrome is derived from the Greek words palin, meaning again, and dramos, meaning direction. And written examples of palindromes date back at least to 79 AD. A palindrome was found etched on a stone tablet unearthed at Herculanum, a Roman city buried by ashes. But what if you have a word that when the letters are reversed, spelled backwards, it still produces a word, but a completely different word with a different meaning. For example, if you spell the word stressed backwards, it spells deserts. Or evil spelled backwards is live. Guns is snug. I used this one this morning, and some may uh, and others may not appreciate it. What do you get when you spell disappointed backwards? Blue Jays. <laughs> and there's a name for these words, too. Believe it or not, the linguistic term is Samordinlap. Samordinlap, which is palindromes spelled backwards. Now that is more than you probably wanted to know and your head may be spinning at this point wondering what does this have to do with anything. 
Just file that away for a few moments and we will come back to it. Today's gospel is a parable told by Jesus that at first reading seems to be, as he himself suggests, about our need to be persistent when we pray. The parable story revolves around a poor widow who has been wronged in some way and who seeks justice against an unknown opponent. We don't know what the crime or injustice is, so we have nothing to give us a clue if it's something petty or something major. Is she a crank or does she have a legitimate case? As a widow, her status in life is not great in that male-dominated society and culture. And the fact that she alone seems to be pleading her cause indicates that she has no male family member to represent her and no financial means to hire a lawyer. She is on her own. In fact, the root definition of widow means to be destitute, to be empty, to be bereft, someone left behind. The judge is depicted as someone who has no fear of God and has no respect or compassion for people. He is perhaps blind or deaf to the very justice she craves. Now the immediate temptation here, I think, as with many parable stories, is to start assigning names or personalities to the characters in the story. After all, the parable as a teaching method or story has to do with drawing out contrasts and comparisons. And we tend to read them as if they are a mystery or a riddle to be solved. Keeping in mind that Luke, our gospel writer today, begins by saying that Jesus told this parable to his disciples about their need to pray always and not lose heart. So in deciphering this riddle, the judge must be God. And the woman seeking justice must represent the disciples, people like you and me. But when we do that, it makes us question, I think, both God and our motivation for praying. Is Jesus really saying that God doesn't care or take the time to listen to us? And is God equating persistence and faithfulness in prayer with wearing down God until out of sheer frustration, God grants our requests. Because if that's the case, it just seems all wrong. And yet I am sure that we have all had those moments when with good intention, we have prayed fervently to God for some action or some outcome that seems to fall on deaf ears. Where is God when we need God most? Have you ever found yourselves in this widow's sandals trying to get the attention of or justice from an indifferent, seemingly uncaring judge? Now to put today's story in context, this all begins back in chapter nine when Jesus comes down from the mountain of transfiguration and in Luke's words, sets his face to go to Jerusalem. In the chapters that follow, we encounter a series of parables and stories that are interspersed with apocryphal references, references about his impending death and what challenges they as disciples will face in his absence. So in saying that his disciples need to pray and not lose heart, he prefigures what is coming for him and for them. The times ahead are going to be difficult, he says. It will shake their foundations. It will challenge their faith. This is not a smooth flowing narrative or travelogue of his final days, but rather at times a disjointed series of events and teachings punctuated by the reality of what is coming. So what are we to make of this parable about the judge and the widow? New Testament scholar William Loder writes, quote, So it is missing the mark if we treat the passage as a general teaching about intercessory prayer. It is primarily about the yearning for change. 
It was very appropriate that the story is told of a poor widow. She represents a behavior, but she also represents the poverty and vulnerability which is the point of the parable's message. The story has been shaped in the cruelty of exploitation and the arbitrary abuse of power. It belongs in the world which Jesus is addressing. Jesus is reading the signs in the wounds of the people. The contours of their devastation shape the structure of his thought because this is where he belongs and these are the people whose cries he hears. So let us celebrate the courage and tenacity of this widow and at least, as Jesus says, not lose heart when he, we hit a wall in pursuing our hopes and dreams. There is an element of mystery to prayer and true prayer, prayer that asks us to open ourselves fully to God and await God's answer, is not easy or certain. I know there have been times in my life where I've prayed that God will validate a choice or a decision I've already determined is the right one for me. I just need God's stamp of approval. And I know there have been times when my prayers have had outcomes I never anticipated because my vision was too narrow or focused only on my personal desires. And I am often thankful God has led me down other roads. I can tell you with absolute certainty that I would not be in this place with you this morning if the plans I had had for my life had come to pass. Sometimes God just smiles and nods when we pray. The widow in our story will not simply throw up her hands and fold. Justice in her eyes is the one thing that is non-negotiable. And she will keep showing up and showing up and showing up until it is realized. Dr. Martin Luther King once said, no, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. There is indeed something the disciples and we can take away from the example of this widow in her persistence. At the 9.30 service, we use a different bulletin than you use, and I've passed out copies of it this morning. And in looking for an image to put on that bulletin insert, I googled the words persistent widow. And among the dozens of traditional depictions, I noticed the one that is printed on that bulletin insert. And I followed the digital trail and discovered this is a painting done by an artist in residence. His name is Ian Campbell. It's St. George's Church of Scotland in Glasgow. And suddenly for me, the persistent widow story took on a whole new meaning. Remember I mentioned the root of the term widow means to be destitute, empty, bereft, or someone left behind. The young woman's name in the painting is Lizzie a single mom whose son is named Brody. Brody was placed in foster care right after his birth. But through sheer determination, persistence, and the support of the church, Lizzie was eventually reunited with her son. There is a link on the back of that bulletin insert where you can find a video that tells her story, her relationship with the church, and the husband and wife who fostered her son. Or you may know closer to home the story of Stacy Gomez, who has lived in the same apartment in Halifax since 2017. In March, she and the rest of the tenants in her seven-unit building received a letter from their landlord telling them they had to leave for renovations, a practice known as renovictions where tenants are evicted while sometimes superficial improvements are made to justify sharp increases in rent. Stacy pursued her seemingly hopeless case, but eventually received a positive decision just last month 
from the Residential Tenancy Board. She says, quote, I think there's so many people who are in similar situations like myself who maybe don't know what their rights are, maybe don't feel confident to challenge when a landlord is trying to get them run evicted. And so I think this is pretty huge, unquote. Remember palindromes spelled backwards? Some more to lap? How something, when reversed, can have a different meaning? What if, and this may be a stretch, but what if, in identifying the characters in this parable, we reverse the identities? What if we aren't the widow pleading for justice, praying incessantly? What if we are the ones who sit in judgment and God is the one who will not stop getting up with every sunrise and pleading the cause for justice on this earth day in and day out until we listen? How often do we pass judgment and have no fear of God and no respect for anyone? I think we can probably fill in the blanks whether it be issues of racism, discrimination, affordable housing, the environment, or indeed justice for those who have thrown up their hands in despair because no one cares and no one listens. We have all sat on that bench dispensing our human version of justice. We don't read the Bible simply to preserve some ancient documents. Our first reading today makes clear the teaching role of Scripture. We read the Bible because then, as now, it has the power to change lives. Your life, my life. It has the power to challenge and transform the structures and norms that can leave the Lizzie's and Stacy's or any one of us destitute, empty, bereft, or feeling left behind. Reversing the ways of this world to usher in God's kingdom on earth takes persistence, takes courage. Remember, Jesus is preparing his disciples for when he must leave them on their own. How will they, how will we carry on? The parable this morning ends with a rather haunting question. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? That's an answer only we can answer. Amen. Just going to take a moment to say welcome to those who entered a few minutes ago. Welcome to the Cathedral Church of, of uh, All Saints. Hopefully you received a bulletin as you came in. Everything you need is there before you. We offer communion in both bread and wine. Just come up the center aisle to receive bread, then step left or right to receive a cup for administering wine. Good to have you with us. As our service continues at this point, in our bulletins, we turn to, or we listen to, an anthem, O Lord, increase my faith, followed by the creed.
As you are able, we invite you to rise as we share together in an affirmation of our faith. Let us confess the faith of our baptisms as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'm going to do the prayers of the people a little bit differently. And uh, if you are not in favor with what I do, you can blame it on the dean. A couple of weeks ago, he reminded us of Meister Eckhart, who is famous for having said that if there was one prayer for us to pray, it should be thank you. Now, he lived in the 14th century, was a great academic and scholar, a theologian, and he was widely read and accepted. But the church decided that some of his thoughts and writings and opinions were unorthodox. And he was subjected to the Inquisition. Fortunately, he died before they could do anything nasty to him. And thereafter, he was not uh, studied very much or read very much until one and a half centuries ago, he was sort of rediscovered and his thought, his writings became the stimulus for the writings of our modern age. His work affected the writings of people like Kierkegaard, Heidegger, Tillich, Boltmann, Matthew Fox, and so on. So the one prayer is thank you. I'm going to try and make these sentences into a prayer. And it seems important because God is doing already what we want God to be doing. It seems redundant to ask God to do something that God is doing. And so we want thanks to God for all that he does. So after I read a sentence and say thank you, I want you to respond by saying Thank you, God. So let us pray for bringing us together to worship you, to support each other, and to care for those in need. Thank you. For those who make our gathering possible, by preaching, by the liturgy, and the music. Thank you. Thank you. 
for those who try to mend our broken world, people involved in the Primus World Relief and Development Fund, Doctors Without Borders, the Red Cross, UNICEF, and many other organizations, thank you. Thank you. For the scientists, the agencies, organizations who work to make food and water available to underpoverished lands, thank you. For those who work for peace, thank you. For the resilience and courage of those who were oppressed, who experienced injustice and war, thank you. for the love and affection from those who are ill and for those who, are, who care for them, thank you. And we remember with great thanks to these people. We hold them up to God during their illnesses. We remember Elizabeth, David, Ian, Anne, Douglas, Bob, Jane, Paul, and Anne, Bobby and Mary, Elizabeth, Kara, Robert, Bernie, and Isabel. And we give thanks for and remember those who have died. Catherine Holt, Gail Lightfoot, Bill LaFrost and Nancy Harris. Amen. Thank you. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes sinners and invites us to this table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. As we now prepare our altar to share in Eucharist, the hymn, Be Thou My Vision, number 505.
in offering these gifts today, we acknowledge wine and hosts in memory of Robert Holloway from Ruth and family, and the bulletin in loving memory of Judd Richards from Nancy and family. As we offer these gifts and offer ourselves into God's service, we pray. Eternal God, in Jesus Christ we behold your glory. Receive the offering of your people gathered before you and open our hearts and mouths to praise your great salvation. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is indeed right to thank you and praise you, holy and gracious God, creator of all things, ruler of heaven and earth, sustainer of life. For you are the source of all goodness, rich in mercy and abounding in love. You are faithful to your people in every generation, and your word endures forever. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with the fellowship of saints and the company of heaven, we glorify your holy name, evermore praising you and singing. Praise you, merciful Father, not as we ought, but as we are able. Because in your tender love you gave the world your only Son, in order that the world might be saved through him. He made you known by taking the form of a servant, healing the sick, liberating the oppressed, reaching out to the lost. Betrayed, forsaken, and nailed to the cross, he confronted the power of sin and disarmed it forever. In his offering of himself, he became the perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Redeemed by Christ, we have been adopted as your children. By your pardon, you have made us worthy to praise you. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus, at supper with his friends, took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread, gave it to them and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. In obedience to him and with grateful hearts, we approach your holy table, remembering our Savior's sacrifice and rejoicing in his victory. Confident in his sovereign purpose, we declare our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit on us, that as we receive this bread and this cup, we may partake of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ 
and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. May we be renewed in his risen life, filled with his love, and strengthened in our will to serve others. And make of our lives, we pray, a pure and holy sacrifice acceptable to you, knitting us together as one in your Son, Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We, being many, are one body, for we all share in the one bread. And these are the gifts of God. For the people of God. Thanks be to God.
our prayer after communion, let us pray. O God, strengthen the unity of your church so that we who have been fed with holy things may fulfill your will in the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. As you go forth into the world, Go with God's blessing. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. As we close our hymn, 529, God, my hope on you is found.